for right now? Uh, the calculations I do are based entirely on a um, uh, a system of assigning numerics for emotional qualifiers and then assigning those emotional qualifiers to words. So I'm basically summing up, if you will, emotional tones that, that are assigned um, by my system to various different memes out and about. Excuse me. And so the emotional tone uh, has been uh, predictive in the past and continues to be so uh, when we get out of our own way and sort of let it happen, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. And for our viewers, what are these emotional tones? Well, for instance, um, uh, on individual words, you can have a, a spread of uh, emotion. Well, let me, it gets really complex, okay? There's two two basic kinds of emotions. There's building tension motion and, re- and uh, release of tension emotion. And uh, the difference between those is how your body actually physically rela- reacts in, the, in its processing of that emotion. So some emotions are happy emotions or sad, but they're release emotions. So you could be jumping up and down for joy or jumping up and down in horror or um, uh, weeping, and they're all release emotions. Uh, And the other side of it are building tension emotions where your body sort of like contracts, if you will, your muscles get tight and you build up stress hormones. And so we can actually uh, qualify and quantify emotions based on this division. And then we bring in uh, things like uh, this guy's um, uh, blue checks wheel of emotions that I've added another layer on to tie it into the body. And then we tie all those emotional parameters to various words because those words are either expressions of our reaction to an emotion or they sometimes can cause us to react emotionally. So if someone's screaming at you, yes, you um, are reacting to the uh, screaming part, but there there is still uh, an emotional uh, attachment to the individual words that are being used. You know, frequently it doesn't matter what they're what they're selling, uh, saying. The abuse is in the tone and the and so on. And and what my system does is we've assigned these values to all these different words. When the words show up relative to our prescient keywords, then we make an emotional or we make sums in the categories of things like a duration of emotion, propagation of emotion outward from the uh, original point of uh, contact in our system, um, intensity of emotion uh, based on its type, release, or, or um, uh, building tension, uh, aggregation of emotion, whether it's a propagation emotion. In other words, if I come on up and I'm really in a, an angry mood and I'm the original emotive force and I come and I slap you across the face, you will have a, an emotive reaction from that, and so that's sort of the propagation of the emotion, but it doesn't necessarily have to respond with uh, anger. If I'm angry, it doesn't necessarily mean that a propagation is going to respond with anger, and so there's all these nuances that go on, and all these are summed up by uh, my computer algorithms and uh, delivered with... Um, uh, uh, some level of confidence. <laughs> Let me put it that way. We've we've been pretty spectacularly right in the past, and uh, we're frequently wrong. But the frequently wrong part uh, is so small, it still puts us way above chance. Sort of makes sense? Yes. And how does this then relate to gold and silver? And what does your web bot then say for the current state of the gold and silver markets? Okay. So... Uh, very good. How do you tie it to such thing as, as a material reality? Okay. Uh, we have to first acknowledge that the material reality of gold uh, has an emotional range in it. Okay. So some persons can hold gold and they get an actual physical body response to it and it, and it makes them happy just holding it. It changes their emotional tones. They've, they've really hooked for it, right? And all the way at the other end are those people that are, you know, rather um, uh, clinically considering it to be an asset. and But they will still have positive or negative emotions around it based on their idea of wealth and so on. So again, we're dealing with human emotion and abstraction. So for all my system has to do is to find the word gold and then sweep around it in the uh, in the internet and pick up all the words around it and then it goes through a very complex linguistic analysis processing and uh, tells me the contexts uh, 
of the emotional values. I don't really care much about the words it brings up. I'm interested in the emotional values for, for these many different array vector, vectors, such as, the, as I pointed out, intensity, duration, propagation, etc. And I have a multidimensional array that's 8 by 8 and 10 deep, so we can really encode a lot of information about emotional um, parameters around a word as well as the context from which it comes. So what is your web bot then saying about the gold and silver markets right now? The Emotionally, for probably the last um, three years, we've been on a very um, a steady upward pressure uh, with intermittent um, uh, lapses of uh, attention, or I guess you'd have to say uh, uh, a failure to to put any emotional um, um, impetus into the, to the markets. And then that changed in early 2016 or so. Uh, and there was the emotional tone on gold and silver became very much more aggressive. And so the intensity levels rose as well as the uh, duration of the emotional um, impact. Uh, but we had yet to see the propagation values go out. By propagation values, this is where these emotions propagate out into areas that are not within their normal niche. So it's, you know, it's, you would be usual for me to see a discussion of gold on a gold site, but to see a discussion of gold, gold panning, um, any of these kind of words, gold, um, any excitement words about gold, and to find that in a gardening forum or a bread baking forum or a quilting forum, forum is is unusual exceptional and should be and meaningful within within my system and we've seen a lot more of that language uh in the last four or five months to the point where our latest report is saying that we're just about to break out into uh, a gold rush kind of a mentality uh within the um united states uh let's say over the next three or four months it's in it comes out in the shorter term data which has a range of about three or four months so so a lot a lot more people are going to be excited about gold uh and already are we've seen an uptick of probably seven or eight percent in manifesting language that we use to reconcile against the actual uh, or against the forecast so we're already seeing that uptick in uh, manifesting uh, linguistics around gold that are going to lead to the idea of a gold rush now this is um uh coincident with a uh, very um uh I guess we'd have to say pressured uh, language around silver. And so we're getting pressured language around silver at emotional levels um, from various different viewpoints. So we have a lot of uh, oppressive language, a lot of suppressive language, uh, not very much in the way of positive excitement language, a lot of anxiety language all around silver. And the curious part around this, though, is the context in which we're getting a lot of the anxiety language is not on the part of the people that you might think of as uh, silver investors or silver stackers, but rather is on the um, coming through from context that uh, clearly can be identified as being industrial or governmental. So they're worried. Now, I know back in 2010 and 11, we saw a big bull run for silver and also gold. Is your web bot kind of showing the same signals that it saw back then? Actually, it's seeing the same. We're seeing the same kind of things that were manifesting in 2007 within our data sets in terms of the um, uh, emotional attachments and the way in which it's being hammered, pushed down, still grows, hammered, pushed down, still grows. It's a it's a particular, it's not like a chart pattern, it's, but it is numerically able to be tracked. And so it, we're in a period of time that resembles 2007 or 8, much more than it does 2011 or 12. And I would um, suggest that we still have the emotional um, in, uh, uh, duration values uh, from that uh, bull run and it never completed. It was like uh, curtailed and chopped off. And so the uh, emotional energies involved have been suppressed and held in place, if you will, not fulfilled. And, it, and it's really just a curious way of thinking about it. But it, I think a lot of the chartists would agree that once there's a certain amount of energy locked up into uh, a particular direction in these sorts of things, it, it seems that it must pretty much try and work itself out. Thus, I think we're headed up again. Definitely. And I guess 
if you wanted to uh, share with our viewers, then, you know, just basically kind of, I don't know, maybe in plain English, where you see the gold and silver markets heading in the near future then. Okay, this sure, sure. No, no worries. I've got you. It's very difficult to understand uh, the reports we've got here because the predictive linguistics, uh, the report is really a bunch of words about words. So we can just sort of eliminate that and say that and go right to sort of a projection and say that right, right at the moment we're in this uh, period of time that the reports had identified, that the data had identified that would extend from the middle of March through to the very end of May. And it actually sort of fades off a little bit into early June. So it's not a clear, precise ending. Um, these um, uh, time periods are uh, delineated by the growth of the language that occurs during them uh, as we move our model forward. Um, and so the projection, the forecast is that we would run into chaos and confusion language that would start spreading rapidly from March 15 onward. And I think anyone who really does pay attention would uh, agree with me. We've had chaos and confusion language. And then there were these other temporal markers that we were looking for, which included um, a, a sort of an, um, a layoff um, a uh, burst or or uh, boom, if you will, in layoffs. Uh, you know, sort of a crashing economy. A lot of people losing their jobs. And if you look at the YouTube and the language coming out of it with the current uh, crises and funding, it's exactly what we were forecasting. So everybody on YouTube basically has been laid off. And so this was our big burst there. So the temporal markers that we're looking for are in fact laying out at this moment, and they've been um, presciently defined in our previous reports here. And the uh, projection for this is that from this point forward, we're going to continue. And sometime in this period of um, what, what I defined of as a, um, an intense uh, grinding of chaos, if you will, was from March until the end of May. Sometime in that period of time, the silver market was going to be slipping out of control of the um, – uh, market manipulators. Not permanently, not very long, and it won't rise very high, but our data sets had defined this slippage as being related to a, a technical error that they kind of make and uh, a hole in their algorithms, if you will, something they'd overlooked in their design that occurs in the real world. Their algos aren't prepared for it and uh, basically take a backseat or, or run offline or do something, but don't behave appropriately. And silver gaps up. And then they'll be able to get it back under control sometime after this uh, this uh, period of time. So sometime in the hiatus of, uh, of emotions that we had for June and July, um, they'll get their, their silver market uh, back under control. But the way in which it's defined in our data sets, that control is uh, it, through slippery hands. And so they're always fighting a, a, a retreating action, trying to keep the silver market down. And, and then there's all kinds of technical supporting issues we could go into at details, but that's, that's the projection for these next few months. And we've had enough temporal markers so far that I'm reasonably confident that indeed we are on that uh, particular track at this point, and that indeed the chaos actually, when we start looking at the language running what I call reconciliation programs, uh, which go and look for the, look for the language we forecast, basically, uh, when we started running those, we saw that the chaos really had begun in, around the 7th of March, and coincidentally, that was about the time that the uh, YouTube advertiser boycott began. And so from that point on, the temporal markers are falling into place. As of this point, I see no reason to change the forecast that suggests that our first episode of slippage of control in the silver market will occur sometime between now and the end of May. And I have a reason to suspect, because of the way the data rushes in and bulges in, that it will be coinc coincident with a big upward um, push in Bitcoin, and that both of those should occur sometime, say, uh, of the weekend that separates the uh, third week in May from the last week in May. Very interesting. And I know your webbot also studies the debt ceiling. So what is it saying specifically regarding the topic of the debt ceiling right now? Well, that's a really curious one because it, um, if you drill into these things, okay, these linguistic structures are based on a, um, a fuzzy set 
understanding. So uh, you can think of one of these things as basically like those uh, dolls that nest in each other. And so as you get further and further into the details, in our case, the dolls actually get bigger. There's a lot more details, but they become less meaningful unless you drill down, so to speak, from the smaller elements into the larger, larger masses. When we do this around the debt ceiling, we find that there's a... um, Uh, Something that is difficult for us to describe uh, that is going to probably be overtaking the economic uh, situation of the government uh, this fall and that our uh, first uh, hints of it occurring are within the data anyway are showing up as we move the model space into the second and third week of August. Now, I I can put words around it, but they're going to be hugely misleading because we don't really, we have a lot of words that are specifically referencing unknown. So that usually is trying to, the data is is sort of, if we want to think about it this way, uh, presenting a picture that we don't have words to define. So in this case, maybe it's describing some kind of a basic uh, government um, uh, you know, like a centipede, like it all separates out into the various little elements rather than a, a shutdown. But these are all, all of these uh, uh, projections, when we follow them all the way back up, they're, they're now tied with the uh, forecast around that, that originate from the data that comes in around the debt ceiling. And uh, the way that the data describes it is not is not really a debt ceiling, but that the debt supply is is throttled, okay, as though uh, debt was a commodity and had to be uh, moved, and if you throttled the supply, those things from the, and there's a lot of words like this that include things like veins and arteries and so on, and, and another point of our work is whenever we get into um, uh, language like this where we're referencing human body parts or processes, uh, that usually is very powerful prescient language because it comes down to an extremely low level primal archetype. Um, and so, you know, you, it, 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 that's why we describe some things as, as being visceral. It's because they hit you in the gut. Your gut actually physically reacts to certain words. And so those, those words are described as being visceral. And so we have all of these things already inbuilt into our language to tell us that this is indeed the case, that we react to these kind of things at that level. And so in our case now, we're getting those kind of langu- that kind of language about a lot of stuff that is basically unknown in terms of what it will be or how we'll end up describing it, but we know it'll have certain levels of impact. So that being said, I would say we're not heading in towards you know a stock market crash or anything like that because that won't be particularly meaningful. That that what the data is basically saying is some kind of something uh, happens to how we deal with the concept of government, and that we're going to get into that um, uh, in as I say the second or third week in August at some level. It doesn't really bulge out until about um, early October. One of the other topics I'd like to discuss today is Russia and China and how they could be maybe attacking the dollar right now with gold. What is your web bot saying about that right now? Uh, Because we have our data sets um, or because we have the processing 100% neutral uh, and because this is a linguistic project, I would not use words like attacking because our data sets would see it the other way. They're defending themselves from what's being done to the dollar. So they're not attacking the dollar. This is not an economic warfare at that level. This is economic self-preservation on their part, and then a lot of that language comes through. So from the viewpoint of the data, the Chinese government is always running, the Chinese central authorities is really how our our data sets uh, describe it because it's awful difficult in the Chinese uh, infrastructure to separate uh, where political power and economic power and military power are really separated. And and given that, we've got this aggregate of the Chinese central authorities. And the the deal there is that they've got huge issues. And they're they're very uh, running around very paranoid. I wouldn't say scared because they're proactive and they're doing um, uh, taking uh, uh, actions to prevent things. But I also would not use the word a prejudicial word of attacking. It does 
show all kinds of, of <clears throat> actions on the part of these two countries trying to preserve themselves against what they see as a, um, uh, a behemoth uh, frothing at the mouth with some kind of, you know, um, a dire internal disease and a, uh, a brain structure that is absolutely rotted out with syphilis. And so you can't, um, um, yeah, from their perspective, they can't uh, make any plans at all that relate to to the USA with any surety at all other than to be very defensive with everything simply because there's no way of predicting exactly how the syphilitic beast is going to flail around next. Well, Cliff High, thank you so much for joining us today.